So it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's maybe the first time that there are so many colleagues from physics at the same time as so many colleagues from computer science. So, so this is really great. And as Henrik was saying, I will actually start by explaining the statistical physics of computation, the name of my laboratory. And I will start explaining about the statistical physics to the computer scientists, and then we will do the vice versa. And I will start back when I was a teenager, and I was reading sci-fi books, I loved reading sci-fi books, and in one of them I was reading that the larger groups, the billions that occupied planets, the trillions that occupied sectors, and the quadrillions that occupied the whole galaxy, became not simply human beings, but gigantic forces amenable to statistical treatment, so that the future became clear and inevitable. So who read the same books? <laughs> <laughs> I see some hands. To help the others, in another part of the book, it says, I modeled my concept of psychohistory on the kinetic theory of gases. And then it describes in the paragraph how, how, how the kinetic theory of gases works. And that's from Asimov's foundation. So he describes in a beautiful way there how the concept of statistical mechanics works. And this is something that fascinates colleagues uh, for, for decades. One of the influential essays about the concept that more is different has been written by Phil Anderson at Physics uh, Nobel Prize where he says that to be un so that we understand the behavior of systems where there are many particles, he says, is not to be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of the properties of few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. So as we have more, the systems start behaving very differently. And in physics, the simple examples that we have the basic ones are the phase transitions. The very concept that water is found in its gas form and its liquid form and its solid form, it's a manifestation of this more is different. When there are more of these molecules, the state of the water can completely change. I like this, this, this phase diagram in particular because you can see the Venus and the Earth and the mass. So this kind of gives you the notion of where we are in the pressure and temperature on this phase diagram and where the other planets are. And thanks to uh, existence of different phases, we also have uh, things like the diamonds and the associated metastability. So this is maybe not known to all that diamond actually, if physically it was in its equilibrium, its most energetically favorable state, it would actually be graphite the graphite with which we are writing on a paper, but it is not. It stays diamond even at the normal pressure and the normal temperature. And this is actually not an equilibrium state. It's a phase kind of out of where it should be. And okay, for diamond, we are happy it stays this way. But for some other phenomena, such as the freezing rain, maybe we are less happy that they actually stayed in the, in the, in the phase where they shouldn't be because then it can cause a phenomena like that. So I hope this is not next to the lac limo. Um, so, but now going from this concept of phase transitions and more is different back to the computer science. So where is the computation here? Where is the computer science? So I will, I will explain that on a very simple example. So I see in the, in the room some students from the classes. So my students will know this example because I teach it here. That's my favorite example. So we will play a card game. Imagine I have a deck of cards, plus minus ones, and I have people in the room. And then I deal one card, either plus one or minus one, to each of you. So each of you will end up with one card. And so I do this. And then I play a game with you where I should guess what are your cards, based on what. If you don't tell me anything, I cannot guess anything. I'm not a magician. Based on what, I will go and actually query pairs among you. So I will ask, for instance, I don't know, Rudy and Martin, I will ask them the following. I will give them a dice with four sides and I will ask them the question, did you get the same cards? And they will roll the dice and if four falls, they will lie. And in the other cases, they will tell the truth. And now I don't see what they, what they roll on the dice. I don't see which cards they have, but I get the answer. I get either yes or no. 
Maybe they lied, I don't know. Maybe they didn't lie, I don't know. So what I collect, and then I go, I take many pairs in the room, and I go collect these answers. So in this graph, the rounds are the cards, the ground two cards that I'm trying to recover. The squares are the answers, and when the square is yellow, it means that they lied, right? Those are the pairs that rolled four, and the others rolled something else and told the truth. But I don't observe this. All I observe are the answers without the colors. And from the answers without the colors, I should guess who had which card. So can I do it or not? So that's a computational problem, right? It looks a bit like, uh, on a high level, it could look similar to, uh, to the graphs that uh, Anne-Marie was showing. But now, how do I answer that? So first of all, answer what? What are the main questions? The main questions is what is the best error on the signal? On what is my best split into the room, in two groups, so that the two groups have the same cards? And what is achievable information theoretically? And what is achievable given that I want to be able to do it with efficient algorithms? Those are two different questions, and the distinction between them is important. So, Bayesian inference is telling us how to solve this problem. So what is what we actually need to write? We need to write a probability of what were the cards, S, the vector S, given the answers, J, that I had. And if we write it down for a bit, we actually realize that this probability of what I am trying to guess, given what I observe, the answers, has this form. And the physicist in the room will recognize this form. Because this is the Boltzmann distribution, the z is the partition function, and what is out there in the exponential, that's the Hamiltonian. And this constant beta, that is related to the probability that I roll four, in the way that I, that I write here, is in physics called the inverse temperature. And now, when we write it this way, we are mathematically modeling the very same system as if we would be describing whether water is liquid or whether water is actually ice. And now we put things together, can we, what, what, what can we do? So that's, that's what this field of statistical physics of disordered systems did. They realized that this is, these two questions that are very generic questions we can ask about any computational problem have a very precise closed form answer in the case that the system is A, very large, the more is different, and the graph, the way I was choosing the pairs, is random. So in this particular case, this series of textbooks, the last one, that's the FIS 512 and FIS 642 for the students who want to learn the details. That's the lectures to which you, you should enroll. And that's the line of work uh, for which uh, Giorgio Parisi got, uh, got a Nobel Prize uh, in physics just last year, but was the, was the answer. So that, you know, you write equations and that gives you this graph. What is plotted here? is the percentage of correctly inferred cards, so how many people I get right, as a function of the number of questions I asked per person. And you see that it has this shape. If I ask less than two questions per person, means that everybody gets asked less than four questions on average, so nothing particular about those numbers, it's given by the formula down there, related to the probability of the dice, I can say nothing. I have no information whatsoever left in these answers about who had which card. And when the number of questions is slightly bigger than that, I start to be able to get something. And the fact that this curve is strictly zero and then suddenly starts to get positive, that's a phase transition. That's again the manifestation of the more is different of the fact that the system is large. If it was not large, then this would be a smooth curve going from zero to one, as one would probably naively expect. But the naive expectation is wrong, and instead there is a second-order phase transition, as we call it in physics. It's exactly the same phenomena that is happening in magnets that are stick on your fridge, and if you heated them up, then they would fall from the fridge because they would stop being magnetic at high temperature. So where are the algorithms? This very... Uh, this, uh, what's written in those textbooks, actually has an interesting translation, direct translation into concrete algorithms. And on this slide, I just give the key names. As perhaps every idea that was immensely influential in science, this idea has been rediscovered 
in several fields independently, in information theory, Bayesian inference, physics, and for decades it lived their way without people realizing it's connected, but it's really in this second bullet point where people started realizing the connections and literally passed the message between disciplines, and these algorithms are called message passing. So just to write you the form of the algorithm that you need to solve this card game problem in the room, it's pretty simple. You just need for every person to have, for every connection, for every pair, to have U from I to J. IJ would be the indices of the people. And when I am sending a message to say, Ed, about what he should be sending to the others, I collect the messages from everybody else that was connected to me, to whom I was answering this question about, about the game. And then I use this equation up there. And this is a message passing like the, in this famous Caravaggio's painting. So the precise form of the equation is pretty important. If I changed it a little bit, it would not quite be optimal. So beta is again this parameter related to the probability on the dice. And this is the kind of overall strategy, how we use statistical physics to say something about computational problems. And here I give a list, I surely forgot some, that's why I, saw. I, apl I apply these methods to, for instance, and the list of problems in, in computer science. These are problems that physicists will probably not recognize. These are not any particular materials or physical problems, but problems in statistical inference, problems in graph theory, problems in theoretical computer science, such as constraint satisfaction problems, problems in signal processing, problems in imaging, and problems in machine learning. And with what goal are we applying these methods from statistical physics to these problems? Well, we are aiming basically for three things. One way to look at it, we are aiming for particular benchmarks on which we know exactly what's statistically achievable and what's computationally achievable. That's a little bit like in information theory, that's the role Shannon, the, 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 the theorems Shannon gave us, kind of played the role to then try to beat the algorithms down to actually work down to those thresholds. So this is a useful information to have when we are actually improving known algorithms to work down to those thresholds. So new algorithms is what we are aiming for. And also new mathematical tools to describe these high dimensional problems. So a lot of the things that we do traditionally in statistical physics were non-rigorous, but these days we are basically doing all with rigorous proofs and this becomes part of probability and, and statistics. So one example of a new algorithm that's, uh, that goes back to a work that we did maybe a decade ago almost is this is this um, uh, algorithm based on a non-backtracking matrix. So this is, this is a very, very simple realization that, that, that we made, and as far as we knew, nobody did before and was kind of impactful, which is that as opposed to the message passing algorithms, spectral algorithms that are based on the spectrum of the matrix that we would collect when we collect these answers, are both fast and easy to use and non-parametric, kind of much more generic than the message passing algorithms that are kind of fine-tuned to the specific settings and on those specific synthetic settings perform better. But could we kind of get both of the two worlds? Those very generic usage, non-parametric, fast and easy to use spectral method that does almost as well as the message passing algorithm in those fine-tuned settings. And realizing a simple thing, that we can take this brief propagation and linearize it, we get a spectral algorithm based on this non-backtracking matrix that performs in many settings much better than the traditional spectral algorithms. And it has a beautiful, it's a kind of a non-symmetric matrix with a very interesting spectral density in the complex plane. So to go on in the second part, I want to give you one example about how we are using these type of methods in machine learning. And that's something that was occupying me for the past five years or so when, uh, when my ERC project Smile was running, or is, is still running, but soon will be done. Um, so 
machine learning. We already learned, heard about uh, learning from, uh, from Anne-Marie. But the way I like to put it, the, the, the way where I see so many things happening is the use of machine learning in sciences. Here I just give two pieces that I wrote in the past years about machine learning being the new tool in the box of physics. You can see the physics written on the box and machine learning on the new tool that is being put in. And, and the review that we wrote about the use of that in physics, a lot of, a lot of is happening. But what do we understand about these methods actually? Do we understand how they work? So when we ask about understanding learning with neural networks, we have kind of one really good news that these functions neural networks represent are generic enough in this famous result from Chibenko in 89. And one really bad news that when we ask about the computational question, whether it's actually tractable to learn them, then in general they are NP-hard, means very difficult. That's also a result from 89. And then there are some mysteries summarized here already 30 years ago by Leo Breimann, notably, why would we need neural networks that have way more parameters than we would think reasonable and that does not overfit the data? We'll come back to this overparameterization and overfitting in a moment. And then still in 89, there is this line of work that physicists started where you know, there were these new neural networks back then, they were not working that well, but it was really interesting and they said, okay, let's, 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 let's do some statistical physics on those. So in this paper by Gardner and Derrida, they defined a simplification, a model that, that we call the teacher-student setting of the neural network. So this abstracts away a lot of the difficulties and actually ask a simpler question, whether at, if we obtain data, labels, with a teacher neural network for which we postulate the weights and use actually random IID inputs as the inputs, this generate the labels, then we forget the weights, can such a function be learned by a student neural network? That's already a simpler question than doing it in great generality. Notably, they looked at it in the case in the simplest possible case with no hidden units in that paper. And here I give a bit, you know, a picture that is related to that. But if that setting is somehow not so clear to you, never mind. You can think about it as yet another spin glass, yet another card game that we are playing. Where this time the weights of the teacher that he's using, but we are not shown, we are looking for them back. Play the cards, play the role of the cards of the plus minus ones. Those are these ways W. And then before we had the answers from the pairs among you, and the role of that in the neural network is played by the data that go to the input and by the labels. Both of them, they are this quench disorder, as we would say in physics, that play the same role as the answers in the equations. But then well, we have the same questions as before. What is the best information in theoretically achievable error and what is the best efficiently achievable error? And we apply the same machinery to actually get the answer. And the form in which the answer comes actually can be, can be is, is somehow all summarized in a simple function that we call the free entropy. Again, the same what free entropy is in physics. And this simple function of one single scalar variable called free entropy actually encodes both the answers to these two questions, both the best information theoretically achievable error and the best algorithmically achievable error that's, that's conjecturally best. Um, so that would be somehow a meta theorem. It, it would have the same form for the spin glass card game and for many other problems in my list. And just one slide about how this formula actually looks like, if you're wondering, that's the formula for this free energy. That's, you know, in the limit, there is always some limit where something gets large, this dimension and number of samples, the more is different. And then in the limit, we get a formula. So this is some Gaussian integral or an integral over a variable that is distributed the same as the weights of the teacher. Okay, the details are not so important, but what does this theory actually imply? What can we learn? And so one example of that that I want to give you is on the problem of that in signal processing is known as the problem of phase retrieval, where we image some 
uh, when we do optical imaging, then the, the, the wave, the optical wave is actually a complex number. And then when it passes through some, for instance, something that we want to image, then at the detector, we are actually measuring the intensity that comes, not the wave with its phase. So we are, in a sense, losing the phase. But then we want to reconstruct what we actually imaged. We must reconstruct the phase. That's where the phase retrieval comes from. But OK, that's one way to see it in signal processing. For the purpose of my lecture, it's just a special case of the teacher-student model. Hence, it's just a special case of the spin glass game, the card game that we were playing. So something that we are pretty familiar with. The role of the cards, again, is played by this W. There is W star, the ground truth names, the, the ground truth cards, in a sense, the signal. And then would we observe the Y and X that would be analog of the answers from which we are trying to recover the ground truth. And when we apply the machinery, we get the following graph, which is the error we are making as a function of how many measurements we did per number of pixels that we wanted to measure. In the machine learning language, how many samples we had per dimensionality of the input. And we see that if we have less than half samples than the dimension, then the error is one. We can do nothing. Just like in the spin glass game where when we had fewer than two answers per person, we could do nothing. And then when it's bigger than half, we suddenly start to be able to do something. And then a second phase transition happens when we have more samples than the dimension at one, where suddenly we start to be able to reconstruct perfectly the signal. But that's only information theoretically, if we disregard the computational efficiency. If we want to do it computationally efficiently, then we have this blue curve corresponding to the performance of one of these message passing algorithms, a special form called the approximate message passing algorithm. And there is a gap here between what is achievable with this algorithm and what is information theoretically achievable. And here the conjecture is that this gap is fundamental, that this cannot be beaten by other efficient, robust algorithms. And you know, we very recently wrote a, you know, a review about, about these gaps and their kind of consequence in theoretical computer science. But here, okay, I could just make a lecture, rest of the lecture on this, but I want to make a slightly different point, which is some really, really curious aspect of the existence of this hard phase and the consequence it has in machine learning. Because here, all it is saying that I need something like 13% 13 more, 13 more samples to actually be able to do something algorithmically, rather than be able to do it information theoretically. This doesn't seem like much. But if the hard phase is there, and this goes to a line of work that, that we put up a few years back, if the hard phase is there, then its presence actually has far-reaching consequences for the behavior of gradient descent-based algorithms. And guess what? In machine learning, we always use gradient descent. So what's, what's getting wrong with gradient descent? Deep learning uses gradient descent, not message passing. So when we actually apply gradient descent algorithm on the very same problem, the very same data, the phase retrieval, nothing changed here, but the algorithm now is changing. We are not using this optimal message passing, but the usual gradient descent that we teach students in the machine learning class on a, on a loss function that is very reasonable for this problem. We actually obtain that there is a big gap between the performance of the gradient descent and the message passing. The message passing needs something like 1.13 samples per dimension. The gradient descent numerically needs something like seven times the dimension. And if you actually want some proofs and some theorems, it's some large constant or even some polynom of a log d. So much more. There is a gap. Can we close this gap? What's going on? Why would people in machine learning use an algorithm that is so vastly suboptimal? That seems like a bad idea. But remember, there was this mystery of overparameterization in machine learning. They were using also way many more parameters than should be needed. So what happens when we put that in? Deep learning is overparameterized. Can we analyze the gradient descent in the overparameterized neural network? Nothing changed with the data. 
So if I put on my Bayesian statistics hat and I want to match the model with which I am doing the computation to what I know about the true world, this is crazy. I don't want to think that there are actually m of these vectors that the teacher was using. I know there is only one. And over-parameterizing the neural network means that I think there are even more of them than the dimension, for instance, for this case, for our theorem to hold. So from the Bayesian perspective, that seems crazy. That's completely, I should not be using a model that I know is wrong. But from the computational perspective, if I'm stubborn enough and stick to using the gradient descent, this actually turns out to be a great idea. And in a theorem that comes from the paper here, we show that changing nothing about the algorithm, but just making the network over parameterized, actually allows us to learn the phase retrieval starting from twice the dimension number of samples. So much lower than the seven or large constant or polylog D. So what is happening here that the over parameterized neural network trained by gradient descent needs fewer samples to solve the phase retrieval. Of course, for the message passing, the over parameterization will not change anything because that one was optimal to start with. But here, this kind of you know, leads me to the last kind of question, claim that I would like to develop more, more, uh, more generally. Let me ask, would we need the over parameterization in machine learning if we actually were using other training algorithms than gradient descent? What I'm showing you here suggests that maybe not. And maybe this kind of property that is so omnipresent is there because of the constraints that gradient descent needs to be able to do it. And this kind of generic idea of properties of nature, of physics, maybe biology, that come from computational constraints, not from statistical constraints or some laws as kind of Newton and Einstein would put them, but simply emerge from computational constraints that what is actually happening, what is seen, what is there, must also be computable. So that's a question that kind of in the spirit of the philosophical beginning of this lecture, you know, I would like to understand more about in the say next decades. And I will stop at this uh, with the kind of scientific part and do my thank you. And the way I decided, so I'm somebody who loves to work with people. For me, science is a very social enterprise, unlike what it's somehow sometimes presented, the lonely scientists in their, on their desks. So here, I tried not to forget anybody. This is the list of my co-authors, many of them. You can maybe read the names, but I thought that it will be hard to read. So I picked only those with whom I wrote at least two papers. So that's a smaller list roughly a half, those would be those in black. And then in blue are those with whom I wrote between five and 15 papers. So there are some, you know, some of my favorite senior collaborators, but also many and majority of the blue names that are actually the students and the postdocs that passed through the groups and that were productive and very successful. So thanks, to, big thank you to them. And then you see there are two names that have different color. So one of them is Mark Mezar, the number 22, is it readable? Not really readable, but with Mark Mezar, I wrote 22 papers. He was my PhD supervisor. I was not that productive during my PhD thesis. We only wrote three papers actually during my PhD thesis, but we continued working together and he's really somebody who influenced and inspired the way I think about science in, in so many ways. And then you see the red name of Florent Takala with whom I wrote, I counted for this slide, over, uh, 105 papers according to Google Scholar. So I, th I think that's quite an achievement. What do you think, Flo? That's about two thirds of, of all my papers. So obviously a huge thank you to him. Like all, all the ideas I ever had in science, I always discuss with him. And this is, this is immensely valuable to have somebody like that. So I end up with a photo of our two labs uh, spoke mine and it affects his here in EPFL. This is last year at the EPFL sign. And okay, so some of the current students are, are not on this picture. And well, we don't share together only the science and the groups, the students, but we also share those two. So thanks to them as well. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you.